Welcome to Motor One on One. I'm your host, MotorOne.com Global Editor-in-Chief, John Neff. Imagine yourself on a Saturday, outside in the sun, washing your car. You've got your hose, you've got your bucket, and your sponge, and you're performing this ritual that so many of us enjoy with our cars as a way to unwind and spend time with whatever set of wheels we've got. My guest today washes cars for a living, but instead of daily drivers, he details million dollar exotics and hypercars. Instead of a driveway, he uses his own immaculate facility in Columbus, Ohio. And instead of doing this to relax, he's made it a business, an empire even, that offers the world's best detailing services and products, and he even trains new detailers to do what he does. Meet Todd Cooperrider, founder of Esoteric Fine Auto Finishing. Todd, welcome to Motor One on One. Thanks, John. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, to be on here. It's awesome. Of course, of course. Now, I've known you for a long time, going back to my days uh, at Autoblog and kind of the early and mid 2000s. Uh, and I first came in contact with you when I saw one of your before and after videos. And I believe it was a Ferrari, uh, probably an F40. I couldn't guarantee it, but I, I, that's what I that's what pops up in my head when I think back to that first video. And the difference in that Ferrari's finish after you were done with it just blew me away. And we wrote about it uh, on Autoblog at the time. People loved the video. And you and I have kept in touch ever since as you've <laughs> as your business has grown and you've done cooler and cooler cars and, and everything. So tell me a little bit about Esoteric and and what it was back then and, and what you've kind of grown it to become. Yeah, it's definitely uh, changed over time, and and I think since you and I met or, or were introduced, uh, I know for one thing, my hair is much uh, lighter shade of gray than <laughs> than it was back then. I have a few of those too. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, the the business has has definitely changed. You know, when I started Esoteric out of the garage of my house, uh, you know, I'll go back a little bit further than that. You know, I was the only kid in the neighborhood whose BMX bike was, you know, perfectly clean and detailed all the time. It kind of stayed a sickness throughout my life. Um, you know, I worked uh, in the motorcycle business for 22 years at, uh, at a pretty high level, but, you know, I always kept detailing as um, a hobby, something that I love doing. I always had that appreciation for, you know, very high-end cars and, and motorcycles. And, you know, Similar story to a lot of detailers. Next thing you know, friends and neighbors are are uh, offering to pay money uh, to do it, and I quickly saw there was nobody really operating at a very high level, and and, and that's what you know me as a consumer was was looking for, and decided, well, you know, let me start doing this on a part time basis, uh, and and build it up and and see where uh, it goes. I mean, I'd travel all week long. I'd come home on the weekend, work on one car, document it, go travel all week, uh, write about that that work that I did, and then come home and, and and repeat the process. So you know, we go from there to you know about twelve years later, where we're at now. Um, you know, we've got a team of of a dozen people and growing uh, rapidly. We, we've continued to grow like crazy every single year. Yeah, instead of a, a garage, you know, I've been in a very nice facility for about seven and a half years now. Uh, we've got uh, three distinct um, divisions to the company. We've got our high-end detailing services. We've got our e-commerce or, or product sales where we, uh, we are the, the exclusive importer for a lot of different brands out there. So anybody in the U.S. buying them, they has to get, have to get them through us. And then we've got our training academy that uh, we've been running for about seven years now and, and have trained students from a dozen different countries around the world, uh, in addition to, to a couple of uh, OEM manufacturers. So it, it, it has definitely changed uh, over time, but the, the core you know, vision of the company and, and, you know, where we wanted to take it, uh, the customer experience, um, operating at the highest level that has not changed, uh, in the least bit. We're just doing a lot more cars now and we've got a lot more employees. Can you tell me if I'm, uh, let's say I'm a wealthy person and I've just invested a lot of money in a vehicle, uh, and I, I come to you, what, what are we talking about in terms of, of what you could do for my car? Let's say it's a brand new car, but yep. it hasn't been, it's right, right from the factory. Okay. So 
Um, and, and I ask this because one thing you taught me very early on was that paint jobs from the factory aren't always good. Like the car that comes from the factory, just, just because it's brand new and hasn't seen the light of day, doesn't mean that the, the paint job the automaker gave it is a high quality one. And there's still a lot of work to do to kind of get it to a concourse level. Correct. Um, you know, and, and that's a, a couple of different uh, conversation points. But, you know, the first one, you know, John, if you were uh, a billionaire and, and you got yourself a new car, first thing I would hope that you, uh, you would make a quick phone call to me to find out how I can take care of you. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if a person comes to us, they've got a, a new supercar or one coming in. Um, you know, we talk to them about, you know, their wants and needs and expectations and, and what they're going to do with a car and, and give them all of the options. But typically we're talking in terms of paint correction, which means polishing out all of the defects that come from the factory. And that's not a knock against the, the factories necessarily, because a lot of people have to touch them in the process. And the more high end a car, the more hand belt it is the more opportunities for, for issues. So we'll talk about going in, doing all the correction. Uh, you know, like a LaFerrari, for instance, uh, it will work on that for about 40 hours to get it to, wow. the, yeah, to the level that we would like to see it and you know, to get it near a perfect level and to bring it to a higher level than any factory could ever do. There's no way they can spend that kind of time doing it, even if they had the, the knowledge. Uh, but you know that's first things first, getting that car looking the way it deserves, and then secondly, it is the protection of it. So we could be talking in terms of paint protection film. Uh, people know it as clear bra. Uh, wrap the car. If the person's going to drive it, you want to protect that paint because last thing you want is to get a rock chip or something happen to an area. You try to get a section repainted, try to get it matched. You lose value in the car uh, when it has to go through things like that. So we talk about paint protection film uh, and wraps. And then we talk about the maintenance of the vehicle afterwards. Is it something that, that you, know, you would want to do yourself, something that we need to do for you? In some cases, that's jumping on a plane and coming out and maintaining the cars a couple of times a year. Um, once it is done, just depending on what the customer's uh, wants uh, and needs are. That's actually another part of your business I found interesting, uh, which is you, you're in Columbus, I'm in Cleveland. And one time uh, you gave me a call because uh, you were in Cleveland and an owner of, uh, of a nice collection of cars uh, kind of drove you up. I think you guys drove up drove you up to, to Cleveland and you gave me a call and you said, I'm around the corner, you know, come, come meet me and we'll go out for lunch. And I come to find out, you tell me, oh, this happens all the time. And, and a lot of times I go much farther than Cleveland to Columbus. They'll fly you anywhere in the world to work on their cars, you know, in their own garage mahals or wherever the car happens to be. We do a lot of that because, you know, although we've got a lot of cars that get shipped in from all over the country, you know, from, from all four corners on a regular basis, you know, there's usually semi trucks pulling up a couple times a week. But if you're a collector and you have got a group of cars that you want taken care of, it's easier to put us up on a plane. Typically, you know, we go get an Airbnb house and rent a car and, and, you know, bring a crew of people to work on the entire collection. And, you know, one of, uh, one of our big collectors that a lot of people have seen, you know, in our videos, LaFerrari video, a couple of them are really popular. You know, this, this facility that he has got is just so over the top, so beautiful, such a mecca to cars in the history of transportation. And we typically go there a couple of times a year. You know, one, there'll be four, five, six new cars there. We go heavy level on them, and then we go in for maintaining all the rest of the cars. And if I could, you know, uh, go back to another story you told about that F40, that F40 uh, that goes back, uh, what, 10 years ago, whatever, when, when you and I kind of met, that car represented a couple things. Um, you know, first of all, it was my first F40. Um, second of all, that customer, I was still working part-time at this, and that customer was a very successful person, about 40 years old, had about a dozen Ferraris. And I was talking to him while working on that car, and uh, I said, hey, I'm thinking about quitting my career in the motorcycle industry, 22-year career, and doing this full-time. Do you think I've lost my mind? He just laughed and he said, well, the only thing that you're going to regret is you didn't do it any sooner. So <laughs> that so I, I took his advice and, and um, you know, the, the, the sales job of the century uh, telling my wife that I wanted to clean cars out of the garage of my house. 
So that worked out. But also that article that I wrote introduced me to this collector. He read that article. He saw the pictures. He, he read all the information. And the key thing he picked up on was as I was talking about our responsibility for preservation of those vehicles. You know, you start getting into F40s and you don't want to go for perfection. You can make it look way, way better than it ever did. But you have to know there's going to be some stuff that's going to be left over. And he'll even say today that was the deciding factor. So he flew up, take a look at that car because he was thinking about buying it. And we'd never talked before. And he just looked at me and said, oh, by the way, I have a lot of work for you. You're going to be flying down. Not did ask if we were interested. You know, he had made up his mind. Oh, wow. So that, so that part of your business, you didn't really uh, develop. That was kind of handed to you by this first customer. Yeah, said, yeah. I'm, I'm going to fly you down. And, and we've, we've been there uh, about 11 times uh, since then. And, you know, he treats us uh, like absolute rock stars. Because here's the thing. We are sharing a passion with these customers. We're not just, you know, somebody coming in and doing, you know, landscaping or, or whatever else. We're sharing in their favorite thing. That's their cars. So for customers like that and a, and a lot of other similar ones out there around the country, um, you know, we'll come in and, and they know that they're going to get the top level service on it. They want the best examples of those cars they can possibly get, whether they're driven or not. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I look at the before and afters of these things, uh, of these, you know, they're definitely the supercars and the hypercars, I can't think of anything you could do to one of these cars that could have such an immediate impact on, like, value and the impression the car makes. Um, it's just so impactful when you see one of these cars after um, Esoteric has, has detailed it. And the, the not just the mirror finish, but the richness and the, the depth and 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 you didn't even know that the the paint finish. What, and, and, and again, I don't want to disparage automakers necessarily, but you don't even know how how kind of lackluster they are until they're brought to their full potential. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's one thing, even after the all these years and this many cars, I get just as excited after every single car to sit back and look at it, at, at the at the changes we put that car through and to bring out its, its true potential. And I give an analogy to people, it's kind of a loose analogy. You know, you can go buy a, a really nice new um, OLED TV. It's gonna look fantastic out of the box, but you bring in uh, somebody who's a professional at calibrating television, they can spend four or five hours on it. And they're going to get that extra 15 to 20 percent of depth and clarity that you never knew possible. And we do the same thing with uh, the paint finish. You know, we've got a, a four thousand dollar gauge that measures the clarity, not just gloss. So, you know, a lot of people just use a cheap gloss meter. But this is multi different facets of the clarity of the finish. So when we're doing it, it's not subjective. We just sit back, put our thumbs up in the air, says, yeah, it looks great. No, we're taking measurements to develop the best process to to extract as much clarity uh, gloss and brilliance out of that finish as we possibly can uh, so a lot goes into it but yeah when you look at it afterwards it's amazing uh, we're, we're getting ready to uh, ship out a new Pagani uh, Huayra Roadster that we've had for about a month now I saw that yeah I saw the pictures I think on your on your Twitter or maybe on Facebook yeah, and, and you know the difference in that thing. You know, it's a beautiful multi-million dollar car. They do an amazing job at painting those cars. But even with that one, you look at it afterwards and you're like, "Wow, this thing looks really, really amazing." So, regardless of the car, regardless of the cost, you can make it look much better than it already is. And you're, you're making me feel guilty. I have an OLED TV and I have not had it calibrated. So. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can connect you with my guy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely after the show. Um, and going back to that uh, uh, LaFerrari owner you were talking about and his, his amazing garage, his amazing facility. I know which one you're talking about. And if I can paint a, a picture in words for people, it's like it looks like the inside of a cathedral, like a gothic wooden cathedral. The, and this is a garage I'm talking about. And it's got room for, I don't know, maybe five or six. Uh, cars on each side and then there is a rotating display um, like in the lifted up a little in the back 
and it has the natural it has uh, natural light coming through the windows for it. So like that's the that's where you put the car like you're done working on, and then like, like yeah, you sp- it, spin it around and sit there and look at it it's, and it, admire yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big tower too, um, almost like a castle with all these windows and the blocks of light coming in and the way it shines off, you know, that car as it's spinning around, um, the carousel. Uh, yeah, it's, it's stunning. And, and the, the, the facility, I mean, I've been going there so many years and look at the woodwork, uh, alone. I mean, this is a, I believe it was 8,500 square foot uh, facility. It took almost three years to build the best of the best in stonework and castle door manufacturers and woodwork. Um, it is uh, it is a shrine for cars, and there's over a hundred individual wooden carvings that represent the history of transportation. It, it's 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 so over the top. So it, it it's not like you know um, you know you get up in the morning when you're there. And it's like oh geez, I got to go to work. You know it, you, you go in there, and it, it is phenomenal uh, place that, for cars. That actually leads me to another thing that I've always liked about uh, what you do is that, like you like you said from the beginning, you started writing articles about uh, the detailing you were doing right from the beginning when you were working out, out of your garage, and ultimately, ultimately, that's what led me to find you because uh, you know, uh, working on Autoblog, we're looking for content that's interesting that people want to read or watch, and we found your video, and, and you really haven't stopped doing that um, throughout the last ten or fifteen years. You've continued to make really great content, and sometimes it's just for the the before and after, after shock effect. And I love those videos. Sometimes it's to show off facilities like these that you get to do your work in uh, like like the one we were just talking about and then other times it's just pure how-to like let me show you how to use some of these products that that we endorse and sell the right way so that you're getting the most out of them yep yeah the the uh, the educational aspect of it has always been uh, big for me in the early days you know I, I wanted to to uh, subscribe to the old adage of out educate your competition. And th- there was a lot of people that I knew, friends in business outside of the industry, said, Todd, you're crazy. You're, you're giving your competitors way too much uh, information. I said, no, what I'm doing is I'm educating people out there on what can be done. And I don't know how many customers have found us over the years by reading an article or watching a video that for a subject they weren't even looking up and say, well, yeah, my Ferrari has the same thing. Next thing you know, we're jumping on a plane or, or a car is being uh, shipped in. But, you know, we started off, I did, I don't know, probably 150 articles in the early days. And then it, it transformed into a lot of videos, um, which we've probably done about 300 videos. Uh, the, the, the educational ones are, are hugely popular, as are the ones where I show uh, amazing uh, facilities. But, you know, starting out, it was just me doing all this. Now um, we have a, a marketing team of three people dedicated just for marketing, a full-time videographer, full-time person for social media, first time, first, a full-time person that does all of our design-related stuff to pull all that together because the demand for that kind of information and that kind of education is, uh, is huge and it, uh, it, it's a lot of work involved in it. Yeah, actually, the, the, I'm looking at your YouTube page, um, with, which is Esoteric Auto Detail on YouTube. And your top two videos of all time are, are how-tos, how to apply glass coating to your car and how to use a, a DA and rotary buffer. Uh, and then the next two are actually the LaFerrari we were yeah. just talking about and that facility. So yeah, if people want to yeah. if people want to see that amazing facility, uh, check out the YouTube channel. It's, it's really cool. Um, so uh, another thing, uh, having known you for so long, having watched your videos and, and the content you've made, it's actually rubbed off on me that this isn't just for billionaires with their supercars. Uh, my wife, we just we just bought a Tesla Model 3 for my wife and my first uh, email was to you asking, what should I do? Uh, you know, this is the most expensive car we've ever owned. And the last car we had actually got, it was, the last car we had uh, for her was a Kia Soul. Um, so big upgrade for her, that's great. But the we didn't get anything done to the Kia Soul. And like the first week it got rock chips. And I was, I was like crying. I'm like, man, we just, we just bought it and it's already got rock chips. So we got the Model 3 in white and I emailed you and I was like, what should we do? And you said, uh, you know, uh, definitely get, you know, front protection with um, with a wrap, a, a clear wrap. And then I also asked you about ceramic coating. 
And so what, what we ended up doing, and I apologize, I, I did not bring my car down to you, but you, you recommended a great, uh, a great outfit in Cleveland for me to use that you've worked with. And what I got is I got the front end wrapped kind of up to the A pillar. So front fenders, hood, and, and front you know, fascia. And then I got the ceramic coating over the whole thing. Uh, and I think they could do like, it was either like a two or three year coating or a five year coating. And I got the two or three year coating just because I wasn't sure like, is this going to really be worth it? And I got to tell you, I've never, I've never like, like handled, touched uh, or, or cleaned a car with a ceramic coating, but like it got its first bird poop on it. And, and I was like, all right, I wonder how this is going to be. And it honestly, it wiped off with like one wipe completely off like everything just kind of slides off this car with this ceramic coating on it and i and it was absolutely worth the money um and it just i like i said i'm it's not a supercar and i'm not a billionaire but i noticed that the difference is is visible to me on how much better it looks than when i picked it up from from the the you know the the tesla dealership yeah no that, that's a, a big thing and and uh you know i was fortunate enough to be uh, among the early adopters of, of coatings when they started coming into the United States, they really origi- originated from uh, Japan, <clears throat> excuse me, from Japan. Um, you know, coatings make a big difference. And, in, in, you know, listeners out there wondering what coatings are. You know, if you think of a wax and a sealant, uh, that can last you four to six months at most. It can be washed off with a strong solution. These ceramic or glass coatings, they, they, they bond to the surface and you can't wash them off. Uh, you can only like machine polish them off. And what they're designed to do is they're designed to maintain a high level of gloss for a long period of time. They're designed to provide ease of maintenance because they've got self-cleaning characteristics. You even you know, hit them with a hose or something, the water just kind of falls off on it. And, and that's a big time saver. Um, it, it helps the car stay good for uh, a lot longer. And you, know, you put it on the wheels and things, wheel cleanup, uh, people who do track days like myself, um, that helps the whole uh, process. Now, the only issue with coatings is they started out, you know, it's just a detailer thing and there's a lot of high end products. And now there's a lot of, you know, me too products out there and people like do it, do it yourself at home kind of. Coatings. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we, we sell products from Japan that are ridiculously easy to use and, and, you know, anybody at home can do it, but the problem with a lot of the, the coating manufacturers coming out now, they're not really detailers and they're saying unrealistic terms as far as how durable they are. Uh, they're talking about all the scratch resistant showing somebody beat on it with a you know lighter or something. And if people go into it thinking that they're going to you know get that, they're going to be disappointed. But like you, you talked about the looks, you talked about how easy it was to clean and some nice durability, that is what they're for. And yeah, the paint protection film on any car, most of what we do, uh, you know, we do a lot of daily drivers. Somebody bought you know, Teslas, we do a, a million uh, Teslas, Model 3s, Model Ss, and, and people will come in and we will do just like you did, wrap the, the full front end of it, maybe the rocker panels, and apply the coatings to the rest of it, the paint, the windshield, the wheels, the brake calipers, and it protects it, it makes it look better, um, and it's going to be durable and make your whole cleanup process much easier. So, yeah, the detailing and protection industry has definitely shifted. It's gone to a lot more of that protection and maintenance because you spend a lot of money. You, you said yourself, you spent more than you ever done before. You want to maintain the value of that vehicle. You take a vehicle that's been properly you know, uh, protected and maintained, versus just a standard one, you look at it at the end of three or four years, resale value is gonna be a huge swing between the two because one is still gonna look fantastic, one's gonna look beat up. For sure, I, I can, <laughs> let me tell you what happened and my wife's gonna kill me for telling the story. But um, we had it for, we, we, we had it for like three weeks, the, the Model 3, and our, our, our garage door that she needs to pull in and out of is is very small, and this is a longer vehicle than the Soul, and and she's got to make a ninety degree turn to get in and out. So three weeks after we've had it, it's been it's got the wrap and the coating, and she accidentally and I don't fault her because this is a very it's a multi point turn, and 
and she scraped the the driver's side corner of the front bumper on the brick of our garage. So it went in right through the the coating, obviously, and the wrap, and and gouged the paint on the front bumper. So we're we're having a body shop repair the bumper, and kind of a, a, a something I hadn't thought of was as much as the the coating and the wrap can prevent smaller kind of nicks and and rock chips and things like that. When when something happens and it does go through, like like what happened to my wife's car, we've got to take the wrap off and repair the bumper. Then we're going to have to go get the wrap put back on and get that uh, recoded again. So that's kind of a bummer. Fortunately, the insurance is involved and, and that'll take care of a lot of it. But um, but yeah, we they they won't stop every bit of damage. You can get through them. Yeah, you you definitely uh, you definitely can. And it, you know, here's the nice thing: in some cases, it can take some damage. And I've even had happen uh, to my own car where something big enough comes up and hits it, and maybe it peels a little section of film back, but the paint is still in great shape underneath. And yeah. then I, I peel the film, put a new piece on, but I didn't have to spend a thousand bucks, have it repainted. And actually the, um, the body shop we took it to, they said that the, the film in particular um, made the damage a lot less than it otherwise would have, would have been. Like it, it stopped, you know, obviously the, the, the brick doesn't get through as easily. So yeah. it, didn't, it didn't hit the paint uh, uh, until a lot later and in a much smaller area than it otherwise would have. So yeah, that's definitely good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we had a customer, a real quick story. We had a customer um, who we wrapped, did a full wrap uh, on his uh, uh, Porsche uh, 911 GTS and uh, black car, beautiful car, and it was the first car that he did a full wrap on. And that, that's a significant uh, investment, but you know that, that's really mostly what we're doing these days, full wraps. Anyhow, he was on his way to go down to Cincinnati. Something very large flew up, um, hit his car, and he said you know, it just made him sick by the sound of it. And he went out and looked, and there was a huge gouge in the film. It dented the fender of his car, and, and got it back to us. We peeled off the film. Uh, we did a, a paintless uh, dent repair on it. It didn't touch the, the paint at all. We, we rewrapped it, sent him down the road, and you know, he looked at that. He was expecting to pay you know, four or 5,000 bucks to get it fixed, but he said that was the, the best money he's ever spent on his cars, and he will do that on all of them. He's got a collection of Porsches. After seeing just how much protection that it uh, that it provided yeah he had to pay to have it removed replace a paintless dent repair but it was far less invasive and he didn't have to worry about uh, um, you know putting different paint onto that car and what it could potentially do to the resale value particularly on cars like that exactly exactly and you know going back to when you were talking about now in the uh, kind of detailing uh, market, you know, you've got all these kind of do-it-yourself coatings and things like that. One thing, I, I don't know, maybe it's just my age or or whatever, but I, I, I'm definitely a person who believes you get what you pay for. And that's why I immediately thought in my head, I'm not doing this myself because there's no way, uh, there, there's a very small chance I'm going to get it right and that the effect is going to be all it could be. Uh, and I'm much happier to pay the money uh, and invest in the car because ultimately, hopefully, it, it helps preserve that value down the road. So I was happy to do it. And like I said, the, the results were by far much better than I could ever hope for uh, myself. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for sure. And, and particularly when it comes to film, um, you know, oh, yeah. in, in film application, it's a lot like, you know, detailers. There, there's a wide range or, or pretty much any, any kind of... Uh, um, specialty trade that you get into, but film is also one of those things that, you know, if if you get a cheap film install, you're going to get exactly that, a cheap film install, and it's it's not going to look good, it's not going to be as good of a, a quality of film, you know, but if, if you pay, you have it done right, it's very, very difficult to see that you even have on the car, um, and you get a high quality film that's going to last, and then, you know, many of today's high-end films are self-healing to a certain extent too. So light marring and stuff like that, it, once it hits the, the sunshine and heat, it, it heals itself up. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, I remember reading about that when I was doing research for the, the Model 3. 
uh, and that, that kind of stuff is amazing. But you're right. I've watched videos of people, um, you know, doing uh, film installation the right way, and it is witchcraft. Like to get a a two D piece of film to wrap around this three D object in a way where it's invisible is not something that I would recommend somebody do at home or pay you know pay the guy down the street two hundred dollars to do out of his garage. Yeah, no, that, that that's uh, definitely not something you want to do, particularly if you've got uh, nicer cars. I mean, I, I sit back there. And watch our team, uh, you know, work on on cars, whether in, they're installing film on Bugatti Chirons to you know 911s to Teslas or whatever else a car may be, and it, it is such a um, an art. Um, it, it takes patience, it takes time, uh, but the work they can do to, like you said, get a two dimensional flat piece of film to you know wrap and conform around it tucking in edges and then have them stay there and not pop back up. It's, it's, uh, it is really amazing what you can do with it. So um, let's go back to something you mentioned earlier. And again, this is something I remember you telling me a long time ago and I, it, it blew my mind. But um, you, you mentioned that for small scale manufacturers who are you know usually making supercars um, and really high end stuff, that and I remember the way you put it to me back in the day uh, was it, it's it's a fact that uh, from the factory uh, a Ford paint job is better than a Ferrari paint job. And can you tell me why that is? And and again, that's not to disparage Ferrari, but but you mentioned that it's these small scale manufacturers that are usually doing a lot of hand assembly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know when when I'm talking about the. Um, quality of paint job, I'm, I'm really talking more about the finishing of it. So if, if, if you do you know, use that uh, comparison, you take a Ford, it's going to have a lot of orange peel in it, it's going to have a lot of texture in it, but they're not going and doing any processes afterwards. They're not touching it with machine. Um, it's not being handled nearly as much or they've got you know, perfect uh, um, protection that they put over it during manufacturing to protect it. Now you go into the small manufacturers, they're doing things like, you know, putting heavy levels of clear coat on it so they can do a bit of sanding to get rid of the orange peel and the texture and then going and polishing things out. And that's where things go bad in that finishing process because they leave sanding marks and, and I've got a, a naughty list of manufacturers that, that, uh, that leave a lot of sanding marks uh, in the finish. Um, then the polishing process, you know, they're using techniques and tools and equipment from 25 years ago, not using anything modern. So not only do they not get the sanding marks out, but they leave their own swirls, um, what we uh, call as holograms when it's done with a, a rotary uh, machine. And you just look at it or shine a light on it. You know, people out there listening, if they go and look at uh, my, my first La Ferrari video, we really show some of those details, but there's the problems and that's what we have to go in and, uh, and fix. Um, you know, we're, we're Honda fans here at uh, the Cooper Ryder household and for Esoteric for that matter, we're only 45 minutes from uh, the factory, but you know, I can take, uh, we've got a couple of new Civics here in the driveway and you know, once I get them, they look good. They might have a couple little scuffs here and there, you know, people touch them, they get off trucks, they go through the dealerships. But for the most part, they don't look bad. But, you know, you start getting up into the realm of the, the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis, even uh, the Bugattis, Aston Martins, um, you know, all that. There is a lot of room for improvement. And even with Ferrari, you know, one of the first things I ask people, did you get a custom color? Did you get cu custom stripes? Because it goes to a secondary facility. And then there's more opportunity. And then there's more it. opportunity yeah. because they put more clear, they do more sanding. Um, you know, so I'm gonna. Ha you can spend thirty thousand dollars on an optional paint job with Ferrari, and that means we're gonna have to spend that much more time on the car because it's got more issues. Now, when we're done, that paint looks way better than just the standard finish that you get with your new Ferrari 488 uh, because it's very nice and flat based off of what they've done. Uh, but the finishing aspects of it uh, is tough. And, you know, here's the funny thing. The, the best um, polishing tool manufacturer in the world is out of Milan, Italy. 
<laughs> so they're right so, next door. So they're right next door to the Ferraris and the Paganis and the Maseratis and the Lamborghinis, but you just can't get the two of them together, which I'm fine with. Because right, that's job security. That's job you. security for us, and I should be sending Christmas baskets uh, uh, to all of them. Uh, you know, we joke around a little bit, but... Yeah, it, it, it's also about you know, what they have time uh, to do. If they're trying to crank things through, you know, even if it's a Pagani that they're not cranking that many things through, um, yeah, there's just going to be some some issues. And uh, you know, since we just got finished working on one, and uh, I did most of the polishing myself on it, I see you know what goes on, and and I can almost you know walk you through the production process as I'm looking at the car to see exactly how they did it and find the areas for improvement. You know, the way I look at it with the, these uh, supercars and, and hypercars that cost uh, multi-millions of dollars and may not have the best paint job and may need this attention after they're bought, um, is that, you know, the, it, it goes to the cost of ownership of, of these vehicles. These vehicles have extremely high cost of ownership. Just because you bought a car that may be the best at a certain thing, like a top speed or a track time, doesn't mean it was made to be best at everything. It wasn't made to have the best paint job. It wasn't made to have uh, uh, $40 oil changes. You know, it's, it's, the, it's like I said, it's the cost of ownership that goes into these things. Um, and look, I, I also, uh, part of our, um, our group of websites is Ferrari Chat, which is the largest um, for, uh, Ferrari forum in the world. And all of these guys know, know you by name because they, they all tell each other, if you're, gonna, if you're buying your first Ferrari, if you're getting into this, this culture, uh, Ferrari ownership, that's going to be part of the, the cost of it. I mean, you, you got to know that going into it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing to consider, too, when you're looking at, at those cars, as you talk about cost of ownership and just being part of uh, the deal, like, you know, $1,000 oil changes, you know, it, it, it's all relative because I've got customers coming to me that are buying a brand new car for $30,000. And if they want to get, you know, their ultimate new car prep with polishing, uh, front end paint protection film coating services, it's five thousand dollars, right? Five thousand dollars relative to a thirty thousand dollar car. Now you've got these cars that are coming in quarter million, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. That sometimes they can get away with just that same amount, five thousand um, dollars. The percentage, you know, relative to the value of the car is is, is far far less. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, it's. Uh, it's not that bad, and it's you know just one of the things that uh, that you accept. Everything is going to be expensive when you're you're dealing uh, with those cars, whether it's tires, oil changes. Um, uh, you know you're you're not going to have uh, the, your local auto glass uh, company and repair a chip in the windshield of your Ferrari. You're going to drop about twenty grand to have that done right. Right, uh, right, so. and and look, I be, just like you, I've I've spent a fair uh, a fair amount of time around uh, billionaire uh, car collectors and owners and enthusiasts, and and five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars on one of these cars is a drop in the bucket. Ultimately, uh, ultimately, their investments, even if they are driven. Um, and these people usually want to uh, protect that investment. And so this isn't just dropping money on nothing. It's dropping money that is, is essentially going to preserve uh, value, if not increase it over time, if, if, you, if you've got one of these cars that are going to appreciate in value. Yeah, exactly. And you know, some of these cars, it, you could be talking about protecting you know, fifty to hundred thousand dollars in value. You can be talking about two, three hundred thousand dollars in value that you're protecting by doing uh, this kind of work. You know, particularly you start getting into some of those older cars. Um, you know, provided everything else is right with it and, and it's got all its history and low mileage and and proper documentation. But you know, if it looks really good. Um, it's going to, it's definitely going to increase the value because what, what's the thing we love about these cars? The, the, the looks or the passion that it instills when we look at them and you walk in and you see a car that's properly done, the wow factor that comes along with it, uh, you know, that directly relates to, to, you know, resale value of these cars. Do you ever do any work preparing cars for like uh, concourse shows or being judged? <laughs> um, sometimes, yeah, but that's that's really not a big part of our um, of our business, uh, you know, because it's that's different. You know, I've done enough cars for like the Cavalino show down in West Palm Beach, 
which is you know an amazing Ferrari event. Uh, it's like the Ferrari event in the world to go to. And you know you can take two of the identical cars, and and this is just a a problem with uh, with the judging world, which uh, you know I can get into a whole separate conversation about. But you can take two identical cars. You know, one has been perfectly polished, the other one, you know, is swirled up and and I mean just looks bad. And that it, it's not going to you're not going to get deducted points for swirled paint. You're not going to get bonus points for great paint. But if your hose clamp manufacturer is incorrect or a light bulb <laughs> isn't working right. in the glove box, that's what you're going to get points for. So, you know, it's, it's a different type of person that's really doing uh, that, um, you know, going to the, the Concours kind of thing. And they're paying mostly for the restoration and the right restoration type And the place. accuracy, yeah. Yeah, the, the accuracy of it is, is what makes uh, so much uh, of a difference. So that's a bit of a, uh, a, a different world. And, and um, a lot of times the judges, they're more concerned with a speck of dust than they are with the kind of condition the paint is in, which to me is backwards. But I, I don't think right, I'm yeah, gonna, me too. I don't think I'm going to be able to fix that. Uh, that judgment. No, world. probably not. Now, since you have seen basically paint from every car manufacturer, in your estimation, which automaker does do the best paint right from the factory? I would probably say you know Acura for the NSX project is one of the best, um, and. You know, I know some people who know our inner organization are going to say, wait, you're biased. We did do training at that factory and we've provided um, we've provided product support and all those things. But what they did is they knew what was going on in the rest of the automotive world. They made the investment for people like us to come in and work with PPG and people within their place to make sure that it looks really good. And we do a lot of stuff for Honda R&D. We see a lot of their cars, their press cars we apply film to. And, you know, now that I'm seeing their cars now, we had like three of them come back in matching or, or sequential serial numbers. And I looked at the paint and I was like, holy crap. They, they continued to get better and better and better. Not based off of anything we did, but based off of their painting process. The better the painting process, the less they have to touch it. And, you know, they are doing world-class paint uh, on those uh, NSXs. Um, you know, it, I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought them up because they've been making news recently. And they actually just invited us down for a tour of the facility where the NSX is uh, built, which is called PMC, their Performance Manufacturing Center. Um, and I, I find it amazing that a car company would go the extra mile to consult with someone like you, like a master in the field, to find out how do we how do we make it so that our owners don't have to go to you basically after they buy our car? How do we do this from the factory? Because uh, most wouldn't. I mean, most wouldn't deign to 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 learn that. Um, and what I found really interesting is that they've opened up PMC to now hand build more than just the NSX. They're doing our special edition of the, the TLX there. And I think the MDX is coming. And I actually um, uh, got to see the first uh, TLX uh, PMC edition they did. Um, I had lunch with somebody from Acura about a month ago, and he drove it, uh, drove it to meet me for lunch. And so I got to see it outside in the sun. Last time I had saw it or had seen it was at the auto show where it debuted, where it's you know under artificial light in a big room. Seeing that paint job out in the sunlight uh, that Acura did with this this TLX, and this is the same paint job that the NSX gets. Honestly, I, it was like I could fall into it. It was so deep and rich and just, I, I, I've never seen that paint job on a mass produced car. And I love, even though, you know, I've talked to some some other auto journalists who have kind of made fun of the, the TLX PMC edition, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, they didn't they didn't give it any performance, uh, you know, increases or anything like that. And I'm like, I, I think this is the coolest car out there. <laughs> like, it, it is so interesting to me that they've taken a car that's mass produced in Japan and they've shipped all the parts over to this facility where they hand build the NSX and they're hand building the TLX and then giving it this crazy paint job. 
Um, I, I think it's just, and it's obviously much more accessible. It's like fifty thousand dollars compared to the NSX. That's like one hundred and sixty to one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Like this is the probably the best paint job you can get for the money in the entire auto industry. They took all the learnings from that NSX project, and, and we were there, you know, from from the very early stages. And you know, we obviously couldn't tell anybody uh, about it. Uh, but we got to see that that learning process. They got better. They got better. They got better, um, and, and continued to push themselves to uh, to produce something that was truly world class. Now, you know, granted, you can go and you can spend you know an extra fifty hundred thousand dollars on some of these supercars for the, the the paint job. You know, are you maybe getting a flatter paint? Yeah, but we're talking. You know, you want to compare the difference in quality. And also throw dollars into that uh, figure. Uh, you know, some of these other companies are paying as much uh, just for the paint job as what Acura is getting for that PMC edition uh, TLX. I, I think it's really cool uh, as well. And you know, the fact that that they're 45 minutes from us uh, is uh, is nice too. We've got a lot of friends back. Uh, I keep going to, to backstories, but back when I was working out of my garage, I had honda engineers coming with their cars to my garage and i still have those people as customers today really you know that's they're, cool they're, they're paying five times as much as as they did back then but uh but it, it, it's awesome they're, they're probably making a lot more than they were back then yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I i imagine uh, so so you know going into that yeah they're definitely one of uh one of the better ones you know, if you want to talk in terms of, of flatness uh, of paint, you know, flatness uh, equates to, um, you know, clarity or quality of reflections. You know, Lamborghini's got uh, some really good ones. Um, you know, you get into Pagani, you know, super, super cars, uh, Paganis and stuff. That, that's really nice and flat, but they're ridiculously expensive. Um, you know, Porsche does a pretty good job. Um, I've seen some issues for a while they have the the white plastic that they put over them uh, when they're shipped over here and then there's some swelling that goes on in, in some certain areas that, that take a, a lot of work to to kind of fix uh but you know they're good so does the white plastic uh does that sometime mar the finish well it doesn't mar the finish but like let's say there's a little tunnel uh where there was an air gap uh you know where it wasn't laying completely fat, flat it's weird because you can you peel it off and you can follow it's like almost like a tattoo on the paint where the the surface is swelled uh where that is and and sometimes you can get away with it by you know you know they recommend putting them out in the sun uh, but we've tried that we've tried IR, ir curing lights or you know sometimes it just comes down to really heavy compounding now it's not it's not what i would call a problem by any means we do tons and tons of porsches but we see it from time to time, and the last thing you want to do is is buy a, you know, five hundred thousand dollar GT2 RS or or whatever, and and uh, you know, figure out you got some some issues there. But they've gotten better at that. But you know, that's their little problem, and Ferrari's got their problem of, of uh, you know, the polishing process, and Aston Martin has their problem of, you know, too many sanding marks and stuff that are left behind. So each of them has a a little issue here and there, and you know, nobody's doing just horrible paint you know you get back into the late 70s and early 80s with ferrari forget it you know you've got truck drivers getting in and out of them you know they go to the dealership and people are handling you know most people who work in the automotive industry they do not realize that how delicate paint is you know you can go to paint clean paint with a clean hand you know lightly rub your finger across the finish and you can get out a light and you can find out that you just cause micro scratching. And once micro scratching starts to build up, it turns into swirls. So I don't care if you're watching TV shows with quote unquote automotive experts or, you know, you're going into dealerships or whatever. People are putting their hands all over the paint and that causes problems. So that 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 car that could potentially leave the factory perfect, the chances by the time you know, you, John, go pick up your new supercar because you just became a billionaire. The chances, the chances of, of you getting that car and, and the paint has not been physically touched by hand are pretty slim. And, and that's where, you know, people like us come into play to, to go in and, um, you know, take care of any of those issues and, and bring it up to a, you know, a perfection level of finish. 
You're, you're giving me huge anxiety about my Tesla's paint <laughs> job. Um, and actually, that's one of the things I, I love about the Model 3 is with its 12 cameras and, and the Tesla Sentry Cam. Uh-huh. I can record when anybody <laughs> like you know touches my car and and can get them arrested for for marring my finish. Yep. Um, so let me let me uh, let me wind this down by hitting you with uh, just some kind of rapid fire questions. Okay. Some stuff I've always wondered. Yep. So what's what's the farthest you've been flown to de- detail someone's car? Probably can't answer that one because um, it would raise too many uh, flags. Could of, you give uh, us a, a country or a continent? Um, it, it, we've we've stayed within uh, the United States so far. Hopefully, until somebody hears this, and you know, I would have no problem going to Hong Kong to to work on some cars, for instance. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen now. Um, what uh, what cars are the hardest to detail? Like the the worst nooks and crannies, or or just just their surfacing? Old cars. Um, uh, when I say old cars, you know, you start getting into F40s or 275 GTBs and, and things like that because they weren't painted all that well from the beginning. You don't know what people have done to them over the years. So, you, you know, sometimes you just really have no way of telling just how much paint is there. Uh, they're delicate. Um, you know, you start working on a, a panel and just the vibrations, you know, make think parts fall off. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the, the old cars that are out there, they're, they're definitely the, the most challenging. Now, this might be a touchy one. Have you ever damaged anyone's car? Um, yes. And you know, it, it's one of those deals. Uh, if you're a detailer, there are those who have burnt paint and those who are going to burn paint. Right. Um, it's going to, it's one of those things where if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's going to happen. And, you know, fortunately you know, I've had it before. I had like an old 69 Camaro, um, that, that, you know, it, it had been repainted at one point in his life and didn't realize just how much, even though I had a, a, a gauge measuring the thickness, I couldn't tell how much clear coat was there. I just start on the roof and boom, there's a huge burn section. You know, I was the lucky guy to come along uh, and do it. It was going <laughs> right. to happen eventually. And, you know, you got to make a difficult phone call and, you know, pay, pay to have the entire, you know, roof and pillars uh, painted uh, to come back. You know, those, those are, are difficult, but, you know, you can have all the tools in the world. You can be as cautious as you possibly can. Uh, but, you know, it's going to happen to a dealer some point. And, and that's really what separates say the real professional people, because I'm going to go to a car and I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm probably only going to get rid of 85 or 90% of the defects. There's going to be some stuff too deep to safely correct or in dangerous areas. It's kind of knowing when to say when. Mm, Yeah, that's a great point. What about, um, what's the most expensive car you've ever detailed? (sighs) Plenty in that three to $5 million range. Um, like I, your LaFerraris and your Bugatti. And yeah, like yeah, see, and your Bugattis and Chirons and, yeah. you know, your, your really uh, valuable older Ferraris and things. Um, I, I haven't gotten the opportunity. I, I would, you know, one of my goals, I would love to work on a Ferrari 250 GTO at some point. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, the stress and anxiety factor of that is, is really, really high because, you know, that, that's uh, the most valuable piece of automotive history that there is. Uh, but I would love to. Uh, I'd love to get. Yeah, my you're hair talking. Out. You're talking twenty, thirty, fifty million uh, for a, for one of those two fifty GTs. Um, yeah, that I, I can't imagine. I would be sweating bullets uh, the entire time. But but like you said, if you're you can look at it and gauge. Well, I can do this this much safely, and then this the rest of it. There's a risk. Yeah, you know? yeah, and I like telling um, customers too. You know, uh, one line I like to use is the worst worst case scenario. I can make it look better. And that's right. Yeah, yeah. The worst case is, is going to look better. The best case is going to look way better. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, Todd, thank you so much for spending this time with me uh, and telling us about your incredibly interesting job in the industry. I love talking to you and following you on um, on uh, YouTube, especially to watch your videos. Uh, and like I said, you can find uh, Todd and Esoteric at Esoteric Auto Detail on YouTube and on, uh, I believe on Twitter, your Esoteric Detail. Detail uh, and uh, Instagram, Facebook, Esoteric Detail. And uh, one other thing, if I could really, really quickly say is, you know, we couldn't do this without the entire uh, team in in our company. Um, You know, at one time, it was a a me thing, but uh, obviously since then it has turned into a a, a we. Uh, We have a fantastic uh, team group of 
artisans and dedicated people, you know, working at our company that uh, that make all this uh, happen. You know, I'm just a lucky person that you know because of being the founder of the company, I always end up getting. Uh, the face of it, but uh, you know all of the great people that uh, that work at Esoteric, you know, deserve uh, equally, if not more, you know, credit uh, as as I get as well. But you know, thank you so much. Yeah, I still owe you a visit. Actually, I I, I skipped out on the last uh, car meet you had. Yeah, you know, those, uh, well, a couple times a year at your facility. And, yeah, and we all, to make it we down. only had about twenty five million dollars worth of cars and about sixteen hundred <laughs> spectators, and you couldn't make it. Uh, you I know. know, I know, it was my fault. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll do my best to make the next one for sure. Right. Meet, meet the whole team down there. Yep. Again, thank you, Todd, for joining me, and thanks everyone for listening. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you, John.